Um, I want to talk today about a mission that a lot of us uh, free market people have to encounter in the world out there. And the mystery is this. Capitalism, and I'll, I'll tell you what I believe capitalism is in a minute, but capitalism, to the extent that it is being tried, to the extent that it's being put into action anywhere in the world, no matter what the ethnic group is, no matter what the continent is, no matter where it actually is, when people actually apply capitalism to some degree, it's an enormous success. And the mystery is, why don't we do more of that? Why do we hate capitalism so much? Why is it that in most of the world, we're moving away from capitalism, not towards capitalism? Suddenly in the Western world, we are eager to turn our backs to capitalism and to get the state more and more and more involved. And to me, this is a great mystery. Capitalism works, socialism doesn't. Capitalism creates wealth, prosperity, longevity, health, beauty, everything good in life. Socialism sucks. It creates poverty and death and destruction and, and everything bad in life. And yet, everybody wants to be a socialist. That's cool, particularly those of you who are young in the audience, your generation in the West. Socialism is like, wow. Bernie Sanders in America, Jeremy Corbyn in England. I don't, we can talk about Hungary. <laughs> Not quite socialism, but the equivalent of socialism, right? Fascism is just the other side of the same <laughs> status, authoritarian, poverty-driven, hunger-inducing coin. So the question is, why? But let's first talk about what I mean by capitalism, because it's a confused issue. The term is confused. What is capitalism? Now, I consider capitalism free markets. We'll get into a more technical definition. But basically, it's free markets. But when we say free markets, free of what? Free of what? Free markets are free of? Coercion. What's that? Free of violence. Free of violence, free of coercion, free of regulations, free of control. So free of government intervention, any kind of government intervention that is coercive, that is controlling, that is regu regulatory, free markets. Capitalism is a system where the government does not coerce, the government does not intervene, the government is not controlled. In its purest form, capitalism means a separation of state from economics. The state, I still believe in a state, has no economic role. It doesn't get involved in economics. Now, a lot of times we confuse capitalism with cronyism. What is cronyism? What is cronyism? The state granting economic privilege. The state granting economic privilege. And businessmen seeking economic privilege. And the state being able to grant economic privilege. Now know that the only way the state can grant economic privilege is if the state has economic control. There is no cronyism under capitalism. Cronyism is a feature of statism. It's a feature of state control. When the state has any kind of control, well, it's going to control some people differently than other people. And part of the power that the state gains is by discriminating. So that what? So that you come to me, you come to the state, and try to buy favors. All states, all states that get involved in economics are corrupt in one way or another. Sometimes it's suitcases of cash, sometimes it's campaign contributions, sometimes it's hiring you after you leave office to help lobby the state because you're an expert, because you're you were in at you were you worked for the state. All forms of corruption. All forms of cronyism, but the starting point is state power. 
state control of an economic system. My favorite story here is the illustrator. My favorite story here is Microsoft. Everybody know Microsoft, I assume, right? <laughs> Microsoft in the early 1990s, mid 1990s, was the biggest company in the world. They had the highest market cap of any company anywhere in the world. And they were massive, right? They were everywhere in the world. And yet, they had no presence in Washington, D.C. They didn't have an office there. They didn't have lawyers there. They didn't spend any money on campaign contributions, no money to politicians, no lobbying firms, literally zero. The, the Microsoft did zero lobbying. And this was not acceptable to the powers to be. So Congress, you know, you, I don't know if you've watched Zuckerberg in front of Congress this last week. Zuckerberg has been testifying in front of Congress. These, these little nobodies who haven't produced anything in their lives, who haven't employed anyone in their lives to create negative wealth in the world, are really one of the great entrepreneurs and one of the great geniuses of production of our generation. That's the kind of world we live in. So Bill Gates and his executive team were brought in front of Congress, just like Zuckerberg does. And there was a committee, and they, and they said to Microsoft, why aren't you lobbying? Why aren't you in Washington, D.C.? Why don't you have a building here? Why don't you have lawyers here? In other words, why aren't you bribing us? And there's a famous senator, he's still in the Senate in America, called Owen Hatch. He was actually at the hearings on Zuckerberg. He was a guy who didn't even know how my Facebook worked. And he's supposed to regulate something he doesn't know how to work. But he's a Republican. Free market, supposedly, right? A Republican from Utah. And he stood up and he yelled at Microsoft. You guys have to have a building. You guys have to spend money. You guys need to be here in Washington, D.C. You guys need to bribe me. And Microsoft... Microsoft, the executives of Microsoft said at the end of the hearing, they said, look, we're not interested. You leave us alone, we will leave you alone. We don't need to be here. We're busy, right? We're, we're changing the world. We're literally changing the world. We're building stuff that nobody has. We're, we're exporting it all over the world. People's lives everywhere are becoming better because of us. We don't need you guys. Guess what happened? Six months later, there's a knock on Microsoft's door. We're from the Justice Department. And we're here to sue you for being a monopoly. Why? What did Microsoft, what was Microsoft's crime? What was the thing that Microsoft did that really upset politicians in Washington, D.C.? They offered all of us, now you guys are too young to remember this, but some of us might remember this. They offered us an internet browser for free. Oh my God. What a crime. Because before that, I don't know how many of you remember this, but I do. We had to pay like 75 bucks to get Netscape. <coughs> Netscape had gone public, but you had to buy the browser. There was no business model for a free browser. Today, how many browsers do we have? You know, at least four, right? Major ones and many others, minor ones. All of them are free. But in those days, if you wanted a browser, you had to buy it. And Microsoft said, you don't need to buy it. If you buy Windows, we're going to give you the browser for free. That was monopolistic. Exploiting the customers. And the Justice Department went after them. And for that, all the other things the Justice Department ultimately walked in to go after Microsoft for 20 years. Microsoft had a government bureaucrat in the Microsoft offices signing off on all decisions. Guess what happened to innovation at Microsoft when they were basically being run by the government? They lost market share, they become unproductive, nobody wanted to work for them, they became slow, Apple threw them out of the water. Not because Microsoft's more talented, not because Bill Gates is not a genius, but because they had crossed Washington and Washington sent their agents there to make them pay the price. Guess how much money Microsoft spends today in Washington, D.C. on lobbying? 
tens of millions of dollars. They have a building. They have a big building, beautiful glass, modern building, about equal distance from the White House and Capitol Hill. So they are now in Washington, D.C. They are now cronies because they learned a lesson. They learned a lesson. If you don't play the game, you get crushed. If you look at today's technology companies, the ones who played the game are the ones who are use alone. Google, Google from day one has been spreading money around in Washington, D.C. Apple, no. So Apple's been, they're going after Apple. Facebook, no. So they're going after Facebook. So when I talk about free markets, I mean free of all that because government has no power. Government can't bring Zuckerberg in. I mean, if I was Zuckerberg, I'm not. I'm nowhere near as rich. I haven't changed the world like he has. I would have shown up in jeans and a t-shirt. That's how he goes to work. He should treat Congress just like he treats his employees. I would have walked in and I would have said, I don't recognize your right to interrogate me. And I would have turned around and walked right in. Go to hell is what I would have told him. Now, there's a consequence. He has to, he has to you know, shareholders pay his salary. So I guess he has to be nice to shareholders. Say. But that was the right thing to do. So to the extent, now I know, we've never had a pure free market. We've never had a system where government is truly separated from business. But to the extent that we have had systems where there is a separation, where there's a little cronyism, countries, economies have done fantastic. When we have a lot of government intervention in the economy, it tends, economies tend to grow much slower, if at all. You get poverty. The more, the more government intervenes, the more power. The less government intervenes, the less power. Capitalism, to the extent it's practiced, is an unmitigated, unbelievable success story. The only system in human history to bring people out of power. How many people were poor 250 years ago? 95%. At least almost everyone. And poor, I don't mean poor, even like the poorest people in Hungary. I mean really poor. I mean two dollars a day poor. In today's dollars, imagine living anywhere on two dollars a day. You can do it in Cambodia, in Africa, but it sucks. It's really bad. Two dollars a day. 95% of all people on the planet live on $2 a day. What was life expectancy 250 years ago? 40, 40. At 39, 39, it had improved because about 200 years earlier, 300 years earlier, it was closer to 35, some places 29. Yeah, you guys are all middle age and I'm dead. That's what it was like. That's most of human life. Oh, yeah, I mean, most of human history, almost all of human history. That's right. I'll join in. Right. <coughs> I haven't seen the shark in probably 15 years. I haven't seen the shark. 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 I haven't seen the this is time. <coughs> the y-axis is income per capita. This is two dollars a day. This is what ninety-five percent of the population is, right? And this is this is the average income of human beings. And we're going to start at um, ten thousand years. Ago. It doesn't matter where you start. The graph it looks the same. And this is this is the chart of, of, of wealth or what income. It doesn't matter. Since minus 10,000, right? It's basically flat for 10,000 years. We're basically 95% of us are good poor for 10,000 years. And then this happens. Anybody want to give me a date? 
the two of them out? 18, yeah, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 
whether it's in the United States and then in England and then in the rest of Europe, to some degree or another, what happens? People are free suddenly. Massive, massive explosion of innovation and business creation and economic growth and wealth. And suddenly, fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer people are poor. And not only that, as we become rich, what happens to life expectancy? It expands. It starts at 39 in 1800, by 1900 it's 60. And today it's well over 80. The mortality of children plummets. By every measure of human well being, by every measure of human well being, life gets dramatically better during the 19th century. It's the only century of the 20th. The only century that is true. I mean, there are other centuries where things get a little bit better, grow maybe, at least. But no century sees a dramatic increase in human life. And that's what the 19th century is. The most important century, in my view, in human history, from a material perspective. From a human flourishing perspective. And yet, nobody studies it that way in school. 19th century is about exploitation. It's about child labor. It's about pollution. It's about all the horrible things that happen in the world. Forget about it. life expectancy increasing, wealth increasing, no you know, you know, poverty. How many people are poor in the West today if poor is $2 a day? Nobody. Nobody. Zero. We cure poverty. Poverty has disappeared when capitalism is touched. And because there's poverty in the rest of the world, well, what happened in the rest of the world? What happened in Asia? Well, in Asia, this is back continued. Maybe it went up a little bit. And then it went up. The time frame is a little bit slow. When did this happen? Anybody want to try a date for that? 1970. 1970 is probably the beginning of some countries. Probably good for Hong Kong, Singapore. Hong Kong is even earlier. Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan is probably in the 70s. Where would this be, let's say, for India? India, anybody know? What's that? No, it's actually 1991. Under Gandhi, India State Court. Uh, no, what's the name? Not Gandhi, it was the Prime Minister. Newell. Uh, you know, they adopted British socialism. <coughs> and they stayed poor. And until they actually liberalized the economy in 1991, and it went like that. Anybody know what the date is in China? 1978. 1978, what, what happened in 1978? Yeah, so the really good thing that happened just before 1978 was that Mao Zedong finally died. <laughs> I mean, no, left. But we're talking about a life changing event for a billion people. Because before he died, people were starving, people were dying. People had nothing, nothing. In the 1960s, somewhere between 40 to 100 million people died of starvation in China because of Mao's policies. He died, Deng Xiaoping comes to power, and while then is no capitalist, and he's certainly not for individual liberty or freedom, Deng is a pragmatist, and he believes that if something works, let it work. And the standard is wealth. They, 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 in the 1980s, they used to be billboards in China, to, something like to, to, to be a, a millionaire is good. Or, you know, things like that. Money is good. That was, that was a communist propaganda of the 1980s. Go make money. The first time I visited China, this was in 2006, I, I, I arrived there at night and I was driving into Shanghai. And about 20 minutes into the drive, I understood for the first time that there were no communists in China. I don't know what they have there, but they ain't communists. The billboards for Coca-Cola and Chanel and Louis Vuitton were bigger than the ones in Piccadilly Circus on Times Square. The skyscrapers were taller and better 
and modern and amazing. Lights were everywhere. People were selling everything everywhere. This was no, there's no communism where you have that kind of dynamism, that kind of marketing, advertising, production, creation. I mean, that's screwed up in other words, right? It's not a healthy place. Right? There's no communism. Right? I don't think we got quite a name or they, you know, it's close to fascism, but it's certainly not communism, what they have in China today. So China did that, and what Deng Xiaoping did is, is he, he kind of by accident said that the county is the kind of area around Hong Kong. We're not paying any attention to that. We're, we're going to leave them, let them do what they want to do. Right? Because he noticed that people were escaping, risking their lives across the border into Hong Kong. And he said, instead of doing, instead of shooting them, we're going to leave them alone, but we're going to leave the whole region alone. Let's see what happens. We just leave them alone. And bam! <laughs> Wealth was created. He said, ah, oh, maybe leaving people alone is a good idea. So let's do that in Shanghai. And you go today to China, and those places that were identified as free trade zones, or areas where the government basically let people alone, amazing wealth. People from all over China came there. I mean, I was in a city called Dong Wan in 2006. In 1986, there was nobody there. There was no city. That, by 2006, there were 8 million people in the city. And at that time, 50% of all the shoes in the world were made in Dong Wan, China. That, by the way, shifted most of the shoes today in the world are made in Vietnam or inner China because the wages got too high in Dong Wan for the shoe manufacturers to stay competitive. So, once China freed things up a little bit, created pseudo property rights, left people alone. Didn't try to control and regulate. They had the same thing that happened in the West. Now they're still poorer than us because they haven't done it very well. They haven't done it enough. They're much poorer than us on a per capita GDP basis. But what happened to poverty? How many, how many, how many people do you think in the world, Africa, Asia, South America, everywhere, how many people do you think today live? On less, on two dollars a day or less. In the world. But their actual numbers, somewhere between eight to nine percent. Eight to nine percent. Right? Thirty years ago, how many people lived two dollars or less? Over thirty. I mean, the most underreported story in all of human history is the fact that in the last 30 years, over 1 billion people have come out of poverty in the world. Extreme poverty in the world. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And how did they come out of poverty? Because of foreign aid? Because of charity? Because you guys all sent money to some charity that, that, that gave money to poor Chinese farmers? No. They all came out of poverty because China adopted a little bit of capitalism. One can only imagine what would happen if China actually adopted capitalism. It would, it would be unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, that's the story of the last 250 years. Capitalism creates wealth, destroys poverty, makes life better for everybody, makes us richer, healthier, live longer. You can compare, you know, you guys know East Germany, West Germany. In, in America, I have to tell kids, you know, the wall in East Germany was not built to prevent everybody from rushing over the wall to East Germany. Because they don't know. Too many people today don't know that it was to keep the come, you know, the, the, the slaves, keep them in their place so they couldn't get to free. You can look at Hong Kong and China for decades and decades and decades. Hong Kong went like this and China went like that because one was communist and one was capitalist. You can look at countries that have shifted from more socialism to more capitalism and what happens. I mean, the, the best example right now is in South America. Two countries in South America that illustrate this proof. 30 years ago, this first country 
was the richest country in Latin America. On a book down on a GDP basis, the richest country in Latin America. It had fertile soil, so it was exporting food. It had, and still has, the largest oil reserves in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. Now, the oil is not as good. You have to do more to refine it. Saudi Arabian oil is very clean. But still, they had more oil than Saudi Arabia. They were rich on a per capita GDP. They spent a lot of poor people, too. But relatively, on an average basis, they were rich. Over the last 30 years, they have practiced socialism. So they have changed their farming practices from private property to collectivized farms. They nationalized not only the oil companies, but every part of the oil supply chain, everything across the entire oil sector. And guess what's happened? They moved towards socialism, and what did they get in return? A utopia of the proletarian. Yeah, if you consider starvation, if you consider extreme poverty, if you consider the fact that in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, and I'm talking about Venezuela, nobody has pets anymore. You know why? Why don't they have pets? They eat them. Because they've eaten them all. They've eaten the animals in the zoos. They've basically eaten everything that they can, and they don't have food. So what's happening right now is you're seeing millions of Venezuelans, poor Venezuelans, cross the border into Colombia. Now, not an extravagantly rich country, but at least there, they're going to get food. They are literally, children are dying of starvation all over Venezuela. Anybody who could was left, and the people who are stuck there are slowly dying. This was the richest country in Latin America because of socialism has become the poorest country in Latin America. In the capital. But what makes the story really interesting is that not far from Venezuela, there's another country that 30 years ago was the poorest country in Latin America. And over the last 30 years, it has privatized, it has deregulated, it has lowered taxes, it even turned its social security program private. One of the few countries in the world that has a private social security program. And they are today the richest country in Latin America. They went the capitalist route. That's Chile. So one went like this, one went like that. One is capitalist, one is socialist. Guess what the rest of Latin America wants to be? You'd think it would be easy. We don't want to be Chile. But no. Now things are turning around in Latin America. I think they're finally starting to get it a little bit. And uh, a lot of socialists have been defeated in elections recently in Latin America. But up until about a year ago, everybody was voting socialism. All right, that's the mystery, right? Why? So let's see if we can figure that out. Right? Because if you just look at economics, if you look at human well-being, capitalism won a long time ago. If you look at economists, Capitalism won a long time ago. Economists, capitalist economists, free market economists have answered all the questions that Keynes and Marx and Neo Keynesians and all the other garbage have proposed <laughs> over the years. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> scientifically, they're garbage. Everything they've done has failed. You know? <laughs> so why do we still why do we still hate capitalism? So let's think about what markets are about. What are they really about? What are the really about? When, when, we, when we go into the marketplace, what are we trying to do? What are we seeking? What is the, what is the purpose of a marketplace? Right? So Steve Jobs makes this. Why does he make it? What's the purpose of this? To make profit. Yeah, to make money. So Steve Jobs wants to make money. The, the first iPhones had a profit margin of, I don't know, 60%. If Steve Jobs cared about me, he would have sold them a lot cheaper. But he didn't. He cared about his own profit. What else? Only about money? Steve Jobs make this just about money? Solution? But what was it about the solution? Yeah, his satisfaction. The passion. It's cool, right? He, he, he wanted to make something beautiful. Something in his image. Something that he could be proud of. 
But at the end of the day, Steve Jobs made this for whom? What's that? If he wanted everybody, then he would have made them cheaper. He made them for himself. He made it for himself. He made this out of wanting that fun. He made this out of his own passion for life, out of his own passion for beautiful things, his own passion for technology. How many, how many focus groups did Steve Jobs do before the iPhone came out? You know, you probably study marketing and they teach you to do focus groups because you want to know what your customers want. How many focus groups did Apple do? Zero. Zero. Steve Jobs didn't ask me what I wanted, thank God. <laughs> so I didn't know what I wanted. None of us know what we want. Great entrepreneurs don't ask us what we want. They give us and then they convince us that that's what we want. And if they're wrong, we don't buy it. And if they're right, our life changes without us even knowing. I didn't know I wanted a cell phone. I barely knew I wanted a computer. I certainly didn't know I wanted an iPhone. What, 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 what don't I want these days that I have? You know, this, well, I have many computers, many iPads, you know, I think I have one phone. Um, it's, no, great entrepreneurs. Figure out what you want way before you know that you want it. And they give it to us. Because, not because the goodness of their heart, not because they want to make us better off, but because that is a challenge they put upon themselves and it's fun to fulfill that passion. People don't start up companies because they want to satisfy the consumer demand. So one thing I disagree with me is people start companies because they love the business. They love creating products they want to build and make something because it makes them feel good. gives them a sense of pride and achievement. The market validates that. They don't do it for the market. They do it themselves. And I like to say, you know, I remember the first iPhone I got. I don't know about you, but I remember it. 2008. The U.S. economy was going like this, right? The financial crisis was happening. And I went and I bought my iPhone because I wanted to stimulate the U.S. economy. Because I read my canes, <laughs> and all my economists have told me that consumption drives the economy, and I wanted to help the U.S. economy get better. That's why I bought my first iPhone. Because I know that's why you guys go shopping. Because you want to help your fellow man. You want to make sure people have jobs. Right? No, nobody goes shopping for that reason. Like usually it's one person. You know. Why do you go shopping? To be cruise like that. I own, you own. I bought this because I wanted to be more productive. I, I wanted to be cool. I, 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 you know, I thought it would enhance my life. And it has. You know, I paid 600 bucks for this. Do you know how much this is worth to me? More? How much more? This is like tens of thousands of dollars. I can, I can FaceTime with my kids when I'm half the way around the world. I can communicate with my business associates 24 7 from anywhere on the planet at any time. I can take videos, I can watch videos. I can, you know, millions of little things I can do with this. I can buy airplane tickets. I mean, this is just, I mean, I know you guys are young, so you were born with this attached to your hand. But I remember the world before this, and my life is tens of thousands of dollars, maybe more than that, better because of this. Now don't tell Apple. <laughs> so what's capitalism about? What, what are markets about? Producers come to the market, consumers come to the market, and they're all coming to the market for the same purpose. What's the purpose? Yeah, to make their lives better off. Everybody in the marketplace is self-interested. We all go to the market to make our lives better off. The marketplace is a place in which we pursue our self-interest. Now this is in news. Anna Smith wrote this in the Wealth of Nations. He said the baker doesn't bake the bread for you. He doesn't know you, he doesn't care that much about you. He makes the bread because he's taking care of his own life. He's trying to build a business. He's putting food on the table for himself and his family. It's not a benevolence, does it? It's out of self-interest. Hopefully, he even likes baking bread. And you don't buy the bread because you care about the baker. It's not like you care about him making a living. You're not buying the bread to help him. You're buying the bread because it's good for you. Because it's worth more to you than the dollars you give up for it. 
by mothers, all mothers, are about the pursuit of self-interest. And yet, what do we be taught since we're this big about self-interest? Good thing, bad thing. What your mothers teach you about self-interest? Bad, right? It's not good. It's not good to be selfish. It's not good to think about yourself first. It's not good to be self-interested. My mother, my Jewish mother, taught me, think about this folks. Think of yourself last. What's noble? What's good? What's virtue? Sacrifice. Selflessness. Helping other people. It's all about others. Not about you. We don't build sculptures for people who are self-interested. We built sculptures where people have sacrificed their lives and died for something above and beyond themselves. It's all about suffering. That's virtue. Morality is not about living. It's not about succeeding. It's not about being happy. It's not about being self-interested. It's about being sacrificial. It's about thinking of others first, it's about being selfless, and ultimately it's about suffering. Right? Everybody been to a museum, seen paintings, sculptures? Ever seen a painting of a saint with a smile on their face? <laughs> no. The whole point of being a saint is that you suffered. The whole point of being a saint is that life sucks for you. Maybe you get rewarded in an afterlife, but this life sucks. So they're all desperately suffering. They never have a smile on their face. Morality is not about having fun. Morality is about the opposite. Morality is about sacrifice, selflessness. So no, we have a system, capitalism, which is great. But it's evil. Because everybody's self-interested. How can you have a system now this is the, the, the quandary Adam Smith faced. He said, you have a system where everybody pursues their self-interest and somehow magically, call it the invisible hand, somehow magically, society's better off. And since society is the standard, it's a good system. So everybody's committing a vice. Everybody's doing something immoral. But when we add up all the immoralities, we get good news. Nobody buys that. That's nonsense. It can't be true. A vice is a vice. If self-interest is bad, if self-interest is wrong, adding lots of self-interest is up makes a bigger vice called capitalism. And so capitalism in our system today is inherently immoral because it's based on a vice and the vice is self-interest. And it doesn't matter that it helps other people because it helps you too. Here's, here's the perfect example, right? Bill Gates. He became the richest man in the world. How? How do you become a billionaire? This is really good for you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disclose to you the, the, the way to become a billionaire. You will have no excuse for that. How do you become a billionaire? Produce stuff people like. Produce stuff people like. Is that enough? Lots of people produce stuff that people like. Stuff that lots of people like. Stuff that lots of people like. And we're talking lots, right? It can't be thousands. It can't be hundreds of thousands. It can't even be millions. It has to be hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people like it. And they like it so much that they're willing to pay you for it more than what it costs you to produce. So the way to become a billionaire is to produce something billions of people want and are willing to pay you more than what it costs you to produce. And if you can do that over and over and over and over again, you'll be a billionaire very quickly. Why are people willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce? Why would they pay you? It's worth more to them. Their lives are better off. So the shorthand of this is the only way to become a billionaire is to make the world a better place for billions of people. The only way to become a billionaire is to make the world a better place for billions of people by selling them something they really want 
a price that's higher than what it costs you to produce. You have no excuses now, we should all become billionaires. I expect a percentage. It's simple. So here was Bill Gates. He became the richest man in the world by changing the world. By making the lives of billions of people, probably everybody on everybody on the planet, almost better. By selling the products by Microsoft that improved our lives, we kept paying a hundred dollars for them because they were worth more than a hundred dollars. Because all of us had them, they everything got networked, and ultimately we get an internet. Without Microsoft, it's doubtful we get an internet. All of these things happen. Life on the planet gets better because of Microsoft. How much moral credit does Bill Gates get for changing the world and making it a better place for human beings to live? Moral credit, not business credit. Moral. The business credit he got is $70 billion. Is what he's worth. But what is the moral credit? How much does he get? Nothing. Negative. <coughs> Negative. Yeah, you may go in a better place, but you made money doing it. Doesn't count. When does Bill Gates become kind of an okay guy? And when he leaves Microsoft, oh, God forbid he should still work for Microsoft and actually use it to create and build anything. We don't want that. Right? For some bastard. Right? No, he has to leave Microsoft and go start a foundation and give them a new one. Now he's okay. Now we're okay. Because he's not getting anything in return. He's giving it up. Now, so building, creating, making, producing, changing the world. No good. Because you benefit from it. But giving it away, how much will he change the world by giving it away? Eh, a little bit. A little bit. He'll impact the lives of maybe hundreds of thousands. Not billions. But that's good. Because he's not getting anything in return. So he's moral. So the point is not, notice, that the point is not how much you help other people. If that were the case, capitalism would have won a long time ago. The point is, are you benefiting? And if you benefit, it's no good. Now, go get stone out of saint. We're still not building sculptures. We're still not naming boulevards after him. Right? What would it take for Bill Gates to become a saint? What's that? He'd have to die. Okay, but if he died tomorrow, would he be a saint? Why not? What's the problem with Bill Gates today? Still have lots of money. He still has lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> and he seems to be enjoying giving it away. He's having too much fun. <laughs> He's not suffering exactly. <clears throat> How do we make Bill Gates a saint? He'd have to give it all away. He'd have to move out of his big, beautiful, sophisticated, fancy house, maybe into a tent. And if you can bleed a little bit for us, <laughs> then he's a saint. Then we're, then we're, then we're cool. Culturally, he's a saint. That's the world we live in. Like it or not, that's the world we have. We value sacrifice. We value suffering from a moral perspective. And you can't value capitalism because capitalism is not about suffering. It's not about losing. It's not about any of it. It's about making life better. Consistently, constantly. Over time. And as long as we don't value that, forget it. We're not going to adopt capitalism because we don't care. Nobody's reporting the story of a billion people coming out of poverty because nobody actually cares. Because it happened because of capitalism. We should be dancing in the streets. It's the best story of the last life. So, in my view, if you adopt this morality of sacrifice and selflessness, capitalism is being moral. And since we have adopted that, we move away from capitalism. We don't like capitalism. The only way, if you value human life, if you value prosperity, if you value wealth, if you value life extension and health and everything good in the world, the only way to defend that is by changing our morality. As long as we alter the morality, call it altruism. Altru means other, other ism. With that, capitalism is dead. Capitalism can't go anywhere. What we need is a new morality. What we need is to rethink self-interest. Is self
self is really bad. Is self is really evil. And this is Ayn Rand's great contribution to the debate. This is Ayn Rand, one of many, but this is maybe the most important one in terms of capitalism. What Ayn Rand contributes to the debate, this big economic political debate. She says it's not about economics. It's not about politics. What's necessary is not an economic revolution. It's not a political revolution. What we need is an ethical revolution. She asks a simple question about morality. She says, everybody teaches us that the good is to be selfless, is to sacrifice. So sacrifice, I mean give and get what in return. Nothing. Nothing. Or something less valuable. She, says, she asks a simple question. Why? Why is that good? Why is it good to give and get nothing in return? Why is it good to be selfless? Why is it good to work for the happiness of others while engaging one's own happiness? And there is no answer other than it's written in an ancient book. God said so. The dictator said so. The tribal leader said so. The council said so. The king said so. And they have a huge interest in saying so. Why? The last thing religious leaders, political leaders, anybody of authority wants is for you to live your own lives for yourselves. They want you to live for the group. And guess who decides what's good for the group? Because the group doesn't know, because the group doesn't have consciousness, you need a leader. And what gives a leader authority is its ability to decide this is good for the army and race, this is good for the proletariat, this is good for hungry. You don't know what's good, I know what's good. And your job is to sacrifice for hungry, or for the proletariat, or for whatever. Fill in the line. And suddenly she says, why? Why can't I decide? Why? I'm going back to that idea of reason. I have the capacity to think. I have the capacity to figure out Newtonian physics. I have the capacity to know the world. Why can't I have the capacity to figure out what's good for me? And why shouldn't I live for me? Why is my happiness less important than other people's happiness? It should be more important. Why? Why should my happiness be more important than your happiness? This is my happiness. You live once. No second chances. You don't get any five minutes you spend back. You don't get anything. You don't get a second chance. You don't get a relive anything. One shot in life. Why not make the most of it? Why not live the best life that you can live? Why not embrace life and cherish life and live and be successful and happy? Happy. Wow, what a concept. And with a smile, not suffering, but having fun. Why not do that? And there is no answer. Because that's the truth. That's what we're here on Earth for. Not that anybody put us here on Earth, but if, if we can't be happy, what's the point? There is no point. The only point is our own life, our own happiness. What would people say? But if you're selfish, you can lie, steal, and cheat. You can do bad things to other people. Really? Notice how they've taken this concept of self-interest or selfishness, however you want to assume it. And they put two kinds of people into this concept. Real crooks and thieves and murderers and bad guys, they're always selfish. And the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and the great producers are all in the same concept. They're all selfish. The capitalists and the criminals are lumped together, just like the cronies of capitalists are lumped together. And by doing, by lumping people together like that and calling them all self-interested, what do we get? A mess. And we don't trust the Steve Jobs on the vocation because they're selfish, just like, I don't know, Attila the Hunt. Well, like Bernie Madoff, anybody who knows Bernie Madoff? For example, I was in the US, but Bernie Madoff created the biggest pyramid scheme, I think, in the world. $63 billion he managed to pull up. It's a pyramid scheme. Was he selfish? Was Bernie Madoff selfish by stealing, in a sense, $63 billion? Was that a selfish thing to do? Is it the same kind of thing as Steve Jobs building Apple, which was selfish? Are those in the same category? Stealing 63, making 63. Are those the same thing? And Rand says, no. No. And the big difference is, what do you think Bernie made up for life was like? Happy? Happy? Crooks, 
criminals, thieves, I mean, liars, cheaters. You think they do well in life? Now, there's only one profession that they do well in life. What's that? What's the one profession people see that by lying? Politics. Ever met a happy politician? <laughs> I have not. Politicians are typically miserable, pathetic, weak human beings. All you have to do is look at the Clintons. <laughs> Misery. Just two people follow. Or Donald Trump, then. Equally miserable and pathetic. Liars, cheaters do not succeed in life. They might get money, but money is not what life's about. Money is just one measure. That it living, lying is a stupid strategy. Bernie Madoff, who was caught and is now in jail, says that he is happier in jail now than he was before he was caught. He had six because he was stealing from him. He couldn't talk to his sons. His sons wanted in on the business. His sons wanted to know how his father was doing so well. They wanted to share in it. And he kept saying, oh, no, 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 it's too complicated for you. You're too stupid. Like, he's a successful young man. See, he had a horrible relationship with his sons because he had to guard them from the secret. His wife had no clue where he was coming from. He had to lie to her. I mean, if you're not sure what lying does to you and how destructive it is, try spending a couple of days lying to your friends or to your wife or husband. Just for 48 hours. See what it's like. It sucks. It's really bad. It's... Bernie Madoff didn't have a life. He was continuously worried about being getting caught. Not getting caught by the government. Becoming so confident. They never caught him. <laughs> How did he get caught? Anyone you know how he got caught? His son ultimately figured out what he was doing. Called him. The same son committed suicide a year later because he was so ashamed of what his father had done. You don't succeed in life by stealing and lying and cheating. Not really. Superficially, but it's not success. It's miserable. And things like your son committing suicide because of you, you have to live with that. It doesn't lead to success. On the other hand, if you're productive, if you're producing, if you're trading, if you're creating at whatever level you are, whether it's a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or whether you're just a worker at a plant, but you're working, it's your work, it's your product, your effort, your focus, your mind, whatever level you're doing, you have pride in what you're doing. You have satisfaction in what you're producing. You're living by your terms, not constantly protecting yourself from being discovered by other people. But on your terms, you don't care for other people, what other people know about you, because there's nothing to happen. That's a life worth living. Again, at whatever level of monetary benefit you get. And that's self-interest. Self-interest is about using your mind. Graham teaches us. It's about being dedicated to reason. And if you're dedicated to reason, then lying, particularly to yourself, is the last thing you want to do in the world. Why? Why is lying to yourself so bad? If you're dedicated to reason, rational thought. There's a term in computers called garbage in, garbage out. If you put junk inside the brain, then the product of what it does inside there, your subconscious and your your calculations and your rational thought is not going to be good. You depend, your life depends on knowing what's true and what's not, what is fact and what is false, what is a lie and what is the truth. So a dedication to reason needs a dedication to truth. And if you're dedicated to truth, then you have to know it's true. So you have to be independent. And if you dedicate it to yourself, then you have to produce the things necessary for your own life to sustain your own life. So you have to be productive. And you have to have integrity, and you have to, you have to treat other people with justice. And that's how you build a moral code. A moral code of self-interest. A moral code that produces, real producers, real capitalists, live by even if they don't know it. They live by it implicitly. Because they couldn't achieve without it.
Nobody achieves anything without thinking and dedicating themselves to the fact. You read every business book, self-help book, what they teach you is to be true to reality, is to think, is to dedicate yourself to facts. It's not a vague reality, not a vague fact, not a vague truth. But stay true. So, Rand presents us for the first time, I think, since Aristotle, with a morality of something. A morality that says that your life is yours and the purpose of your life is to achieve happiness and flourishing. To achieve success at living, at being a human being. And she gives the virtues and values that are necessary to do that. But that should be what morality is about. Morality shouldn't teach us how to sacrifice and die, how to live for other people. Morality should teach us how to live the best life possible for ourselves. That's what Aristotle did. That's what I man did. Agree or disagree with the details. What's important is the principle. This is what morality should be about. And if you live for yourself, if you're dedicated to your own happiness, if you're dedicated to your own independent mind, would you tolerate some government bureaucrat telling you what business you can or cannot open, under what terms you can open it or close it, under what, what drugs you can take or not take, what medicine you can use or not use? Whether you can use Uber or not, I understand it's legal, illegal here in Budapest. I mean, what human being of self-esteem needs the government to tell them whether it's okay to use a taxi or Uber? Shouldn't you be able to make that choice? In other words, if you're self-interested, if you have self-esteem, if you care about yourself, you don't accept bureaucrats, government officials, anybody telling you how to live. You live by your own judgment. And therefore, Capitalism is the only system you would accept. So I think we've won the economic argument. In a sense, we've won the political argument. But we've lost them all. <coughs> but that's what we need to win. So what we need is an ethical revolution, a moral revolution. In this book, the of revolution, what we're talking about here is not a political economic revolution. What we're talking about is a moral revolution. Because if we win that one, Everything else is easy. Everything else is easy. No individual of self esteem wants social. They are willing to fight for capital. Thank you.